Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to the Shintar Higashi Show with Peter Yu. And today we're going to talk about self-defense. Judo and self-defense specifically. Right. So I, I know that this is probably the most frequently asked questions for you. The people uh, ask me all the time. Yeah. So why, just to get us started off, why do you think that is? Like that is the most frequently asked question. Well, you know, people want to defend themselves, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to go to the movies with my girlfriend. There's going to be somebody right. that's rowdy there. You know, can I protect her? Can I protect myself, right? Uh -huh. You know, people say like, ah, oh, I need to avoid conflict and all this stuff. But it's like sometimes conflict finds you, right? right? So they want to feel confident like, hey, I can walk through these streets of New York City or wherever you're living and I could defend myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's very important to a lot of people to feel secure and strong and mm -hmm. being able to control the environment, really. Right. Oh, yeah, I think the point you made about controlling the environment is uh, is good. I actually uh, think if you know self defense or you, if you feel confident that you can defend yourself, it's easier to avoid conflict even because you're kind of uh, like you said controlling the environment, removing all the uh, as many variables as possible. Yeah. So, and that allows you to be you know more cognizant about the environment and then maybe you know. More, stay calmer and then just avoid conflict yeah. altogether. Yeah, avoiding the conflict is really important, you know, and a lot of the times when you do martial arts, it's a very humbling experience. Right. And you see how vulnerable you are. You join a judo school, you go in there, there's 30 people, you're the smallest and the weakest sometimes and you get mm -hmm. ragdolled, you know, and then, right, that, that happens all the right. time. You know, right, I, used to exactly. see these, I remember, I'll never forget, there was this massive dude that walked in where everyone yeah. was like, oh my God, this guy's huge, right? He must yeah. have been like 6'2", 200 pounds, good fit, person mm -hmm. and he was already a judo brown belt and here you are you know mm -hmm. much shorter in stature <laughs> software engineer it's like hey guys i want the prince and big smile on your face and this guy was like all right i'm gonna go after him right and this guy came at you and you slammed him and then the guy pulled his calf and then he quit oh. but like that's a humbling experience you know what i mean no one in yeah. the in a million years would have thought that guy would have been able to, right? You would be able to take that guy just right. based on appearances alone, you know? Not to say you don't look like a, a tough guy. Not saying <laughs> that, but, you know. Well, yeah. I, right? It's humbling. I, I try to, I try to uh, kind of hide my toughness, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And it's humbling. You know the real, yeah. you know the reality of it. You know, some, yeah. a lot of these people watch a movie. They feel overconfident and they think that they can, you know, I'm pretty athletic, you know, like you look at, you know, Nate Robinson, the NBA player, like I've never boxed before. Oh, yeah, I saw that video. Against, you know, Jake Paul, that stuff happens all the time, right. uh, you know, every single day. So once you do martial arts, you're humbled. And now, you know, the abilities of some people with that particular skill set, therefore, you're a lot less likely to get into a conflict. Right. So let's just get into the crux of the issue. Is judo... Mm -hmm good for self-defense oh absolutely what's your take absolutely. on that yeah yeah i think it's great uh there's a lot of direct and indirect skills that you gain from mm -hmm. judo uh one of the things that people might say is like oh but you're never wearing a jacket you know right so you got to carry around two jackets and every time you get into it you give <laughs> them the jacket the <laughs> no i'm kidding with that but uh there's a lot of things about judo that can definitely help uh with self-defense i don't think it's the only uh thing that you need to do to defend yourself Mm -hmm. uh, but the real long question is it depends because right. right, who are you defending yourself against and all these other questions mm -hmm. really come to mind. You know, is the person skilled at striking? Is the person not skilled at striking? Right. Right. Are you defending against someone that's bigger and stronger than you? Right. And there's sort of this like there's this graph, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, uh, yes, you can overcome strength and athletic ability to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, you know, people talk about this a lot in the martial arts community, but like if I were to defend myself against a gorilla, a gorilla right. doesn't have any skill, you know, and he's built like me with two arms and two legs, right? He outweighs me. He's more athletic than me, <laughs> right? He doesn't have any martial arts training though. Right. So theoretically, he goes to grab me. I take and parry the hand, shooting on the legs, take him <laughs> down. It's like, no, nah, that's not going to work. You know yeah, what I'm I mean? Just, I'm just imagining, yeah, the oh, pe people who are listening... For those who are listening, yeah, you should never try to <laughs> fight a gorilla yeah. if you Do ever not go encounter, yeah. fight a gorilla. But yeah, yeah that's that's a. Uh, I think you a lot of people uh, so, tend to forget the the intricacies of the situation. It's a, there's a lot of variables involved: the technique, yeah. the weights, the strength, and then they all come into play. 
Yeah. And in that way, in uh, j- judo, I think tries to eliminate it, it, it tries to bring itself close to those that kind of situations in a way because uh, uh, uh thanks to this concept of randori the free practice right the yeah. sparring yeah so that's definitely one of the biggest parts of the sport that's helpful mm-hmm. and it's not unique to judo right if you look at wrestling if you look at sambo right mm-hmm. those grappling arts that you and train BJJ every day too, at a yeah. very yeah very mm-hmm. high intensity level Right, and you're getting used to being, you know, putting your head down and grabbed and yanked on, and then you're mm-hmm. tired, and it's a full throttle thing. Right, and it's your body against the other person's body in a way where you guys have a common goal, which mm-hmm. is conflicting, right, mm-hmm. with one another, and then you guys are going live, which is that's what it's going to be like. It simulates right. real world stressors, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes when you're doing boxing, you can't do that. Yeah, I mean, you the- can you spar, but you can't spar day in and day out. Right. In judo, wrestling. You go in there and you're sparring every single day, you know, five minute rounds, five rounds of them, like five by five, yeah. you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. You're going hard, you're going hard. And it, there's uh, something about that that really helps you mentally, mm-hmm. right? Some guy comes up to you and puts their hands on you, like really puts their hands on you right. with intent to take you down or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, shoot, like I've been here before. Right. That, and it's that, very familiar. Yeah. That mental aspect right. is... A very important yeah that that you know yeah controlling your nerves and the level of adrenaline that's rushing through your body it just a lot of times everything goes out the window right when you uh when you're not able to control that and you just forget the yeah techniques yeah. and you're just like swinging wild yeah yeah the mental stuff is huge you know just like the way you said it you know with uh controlling your nerves and all that stuff yeah. but you know a lot of the stuff it's like okay what do i have to lose versus what do they have to lose right you know what i mean if you're getting yeah. into it in new york city with someone that's just a crazy person you know that's right off the street they have nothing to lose and you know you have everything to lose right oh right. man i have a kid at home and it's like Right. Could I take this guy down and, you know, pound his face? And yes, but I'm not going to because I have a kid at home who's right. relying on me. You know, it's like I, I got to go home to my child. You know, I can't get locked up here or whatever it is, you know. And yeah. Not just that, but like attention is huge. You know, right. like are you walking down the street listening to a podcast? Maybe you're mm-hmm. walking down the street listening to the Shintaro Higashi show. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, is so funny, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get jumped. Right. And then, you know, like you're discombobulated and now all of a sudden where did you go <laughs> then you know what yeah. i mean so the you didn't even have time to give him the jacket the spare jacket <laughs> right and so now we talked about the uh how judo system you know especially around free sparring can help yeah. with self-defense in both physically and mentally but there is some criticism out there about judo in that especially around this uh, the rule sets around the yeah. randori, the sparring, yeah. where yeah. you know the leg grabs, and then oh, you can't punch, or you yeah. know all these. Uh, what? So, what do you say to that? There's always criticisms for every rule set and every martial art. Right. People have this very high. I'm not shit on uh, boxing. I love boxing. I'm, mm. I, I box myself, but it's like you look at any boxing match and how mm. what percentage of the time are they linked up in that clinch position. A good portion of the time. Yeah. Every round, you see like three yeah. or four times where they're just like clinched up and they're like, okay, you know, like nothing bad can happen here. Let's look at the referee. Like mm-hmm. that's the biggest, it's a huge gap in boxing. Right. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to knock you out, knock you out. And if you have very basic boxing skills and then you could only just play defense and then try to force a clinch, like people could do that even with the nice big skill gap mm-hmm. in the, the two boxers. Right, And I'm not talking about, like, can I close the distance between Mike Tyson and then force a clinch? I'm not saying that. Mm. You know, I'm talking about two uh, boxers, right? High-level right. boxer and, like, a mid-level boxer. Can the mid-level boxer force a clinch and then throw them? Right. You know what I mean? So every rule set, every sport, every martial art has gaps like this. Right. You know, it's like you could argue, like, oh, Muay Thai is excellent for kicking somebody in the head. It's like, what if you're wearing jeans? Right. You know you can't, what you if can't the guy, raise your leg yeah. that high. <laughs> it's like, okay, what about, look at combat sambo. You kick, punch, shooting on the legs. Everything about combat sambo is the way to defend yourself. Okay, what if the guy's a knife? Right. You know, what if you get pepper sprayed first? You know? <laughs> yeah, like, I, yeah. I, pepper spray is great. You know, yeah. a lot of people have it. You know, people can purchase it on eBay. Yeah, they might you know be I mean? far so, more effective, actually. 
Yeah, it's very like, effective. Yeah. And, you know, it really always does come down to the question of, like, who you're defending yourself right. against. If you're defending yourself against an MMA fighter, mm-hmm. you know, because you spilled beer on his shoes or something like this, and the guy was pissed off in a bar, and he's, like, shoving you, mm-hmm. and he has 30 pounds on you, and you did three months of judo classes, you're going to get rocked. Right. <laughs> without, that's without a doubt, yeah. you know, and then people are going to be like, Oh, judo player gets beaten by MMA fighter. It's like, well, that's not really what happened. Here. Right. You got to take it, the whole context. Skilled fighter yeah. beat the piss out of somebody who just yeah. started judo a couple of weeks right. ago or a couple of months ago. Yeah. So there is tons of context that gets taken out of it. You know, it's the classic question of like wrestling versus BJJ. Which would win? It's like, mm-hmm. who, what are we talking about here? Hi, right. Right. And you see these things on YouTube. I saw a video the other day of like mm-hmm. a kung fu master versus MMA fighter. Oh my god, David, the, I, I, we might have watched the same video. It's like, was it a compilation of every all this Kung yeah, Fu Masters? Yeah, they do all this stuff. <laughs> but sometimes it's not fair, because I saw one, the Kung Fu Master was like 40-something years old, out of shape and yeah. small, and then the MMA fighter came out, and like he's like young, strong, <laughs> know, and broad. Yeah. Like, it's like, all right, it doesn't matter Kung Fu or MMA. Like, right. that big dude, you know, probably going to maul the guy, no matter what. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like that's not fair. It's not you're not comparing apples and apples. You know yeah, what I mean? apples and oranges. You're comparing are... like apples and monkeys. Like that's yeah. how different the <laughs> thing is. You know? Right. That's cool. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, so another aspect about the judo rule set people often criticize is yeah. the ippon. So uh, the fact that judo matches don't go continue until someone actually submits. You know, we yeah. say oh. Ippon. I think a lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners tend to, you know, raise this uh, concern. Uh, mm. But I do, I, I do want to recognize that yes, yeah, there's in a way that makes sense. You know, but it's on the mat, if especially like if you throw someone, it's not like yeah. the person is completely done. So yeah. what, what do you think about that? The aspect of should we in this self-defense context, do you think we should try to practice until we we can get like the goal is to get submissions instead of just throwing someone i mean if you look at our dojo the way Mm -hmm. we used to train you know we don't i don't throw you once and then it's over the time continues right it's a continuous perpetual thing right it's like all right you have five minutes on the clock you're doing your round time ends you go with another person five minutes Mm -hmm. on the clock whether i get taken down or you get taken down and given the space constraints Mm -hmm. right uh, because if I'm doing groundwork and if I'm looking for submissions and then if the person next to me is doing stand-up, it's dangerous. But right. given the time and then the right amount of space, it's like, okay, we're continuing to the ground. Take the person down, slam them, pin them. And, you right. know, you know, at my dojo, you're not holding someone and pinning them for 20 seconds. You know, right. I say control them for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Let the person try to fight out. Let them go look for a submission. Right. right? It's all on how you train. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're training only for the IJF and the international mm-hmm. training, you know, just with your goal being, I want an Olympic gold medal. Okay, then train that way. Right. right? Train for that rule set. Train to gain every advantage under those rule sets. Mm -hmm. But the training is not always like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Because at the dojo, any dojo, you got people who are competitors. You got people who are non-competitors. Right. All those different things. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you know, the epon ends it in a judo match if you're doing a judo match in a competition. But in the practice room, that's not usually the case. Right. Right. And it really does come down to your instructor. You know, mm-hmm. uh, if you're only doing, OK, take down wins it and that's it. And then, you know, you're doing Nawaza and OK, you hold them for 20 seconds and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then you have two guys just trying to pin each other the whole time. Right. And then you're pinning them and then time goes 20 seconds and then you get pinned again and time goes 20 seconds. And that's your almost your entire round. Mm-hmm. You know, like two standing exchanges, two times in the ground, holding each other for 20 seconds each. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a three minute round right there, you know. That you get nothing out of that. Right. So right? Th- As opposed to like, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just uh, kind of throwing the question back at you. Like, so do you, you do, mm. you you are recognizing that, you know, the uh, focus of judo rule set that, which is the Ippon, is not quite aligned with the goal of self-defense in a way. That's, Somewhat. Uh, yeah. Right. Because the Ippon is about... Uh, taking one point Mm -hmm. and the point is about control right right? so it's like you have to have control to put the other person's two 
tops of the shoulder blades down into the floor. Right. Right. And I'm going to indirectly say that if you're capable of lifting the person up over your head and then slamming their back, the two shoulder blades, the scapulas down into the ground, you have enough control. Right. Mm-hmm. You have enough control to a point where it's like, okay, I'm going to put them on the shoulders or I'm going to put it on, on their head. Right. Right. And when you're training in that way to develop the balance, right, the goal is me take your balance mm-hmm. while I keep my own. Mm-hmm. Right. If I take your balance and I knock you over, and if I lose my balance, we're both going down. There's zero right, control, right. right? If I take your balance, I could create a fulcrum or all these different uh, leverage ideas or physics, and then I'm slamming you while keeping my balance, then I could apply force into the ground, right? That is the game. Mm-hmm. So the more control, the better, right? Even when you take down, right? Even when the pin position, you're controlling your opponent, you're restricting their movement, and then you could go into a submission, right? Right. So the e stuff, I think, is very valuable mm-hmm. because... If the goal is self-defense, like, oh, it's everything's got to be martial, uh, we're going to get me and you on the mat, uh, we're going <laughs> to try to slam each other on our head right. and injure each other, that's more of a real-life scenario, then we're not going to make it out of there, right? Right. So the e I think, has very big merits. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to train in that way. Or, you know, just the injury risk is too high. Right. That's an interesting point you raise about control because it's actually, if you have done judo, you probably know that it's actually harder to control the person while you're throwing the person. Like it's trying to yeah, it's very hard. make yeah. sure it's harder than just like, oh, take down and then anything goes. It's actually harder to make sure, you know, you need, you need to practice more to make sure, ensure yeah. that your uh, partner lands flat on the back. And, yeah. and then, you know, I think this, uh, I, when I took BJJ classes, they emphasized this point too, uh, the uh, control before submission you know yeah you, ha- yeah. you, you got to establish your oh i think they say position before submission in a way you have to establish control and position before you can go for any kind of attack yeah and that's very true yeah, yeah. so yeah that's uh uh that's uh, i think a good segue to because you mentioned some other uh martial arts uh so that as as um People may not know, actually, uh, you also practice other martial arts, like you mentioned boxing, yeah. but you also do Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Aikido and uh, Karate. You, karate. Yeah. You've, all, yeah, you've done, done it all. Yeah. I have wrestled. Yeah. I, did, I did all of it. I did, I've <laughs> literally done all I probably haven't done any like Chinese martial arts right? or like the Filipino Eskrima stuff with the right. sticks. Like I've never really done those. Um, and one day I want to get into yeah. it. You know, there's merits to all of this stuff, right. I think. Yeah, so right. let's talk about that. I don't like. Let's talk about Aikido first, because um, mm. I know I, I do see a lot of. Like I think, in this context of self defense, uh, yeah. Aikido gets a lot of flack in a way. Yeah, and, yeah, and they then, get a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, as an Aikido practitioner, I've uh, I'm curious to see uh, hear what you th- what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I. So, uh, that's a very good one and a mm-hmm. controversial one. <laughs> I know a lot of people listening are going to, you know, uh, nod and agree or be like, oh my God, that's right. crazy. Uh, I think there's a place for it. I really, really, really do. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not fair when you people are watching Steven Seagal, like an older <laughs> version of him and yeah. saying that, you know, this and that. And it's just not fair, right? Because he's an older, you know, person. And right. it's not the martial art i think for self-defense but that's Mm -hmm. not what it's for right you know what i mean and the reason why i think there's a place for it is because there's going to come a time where you can't do judo Mm -hmm. there's going to come a time when you can't box anymore there's going to come a time when you can't do jiu-jitsu anymore Mm -hmm. but maybe you could do some aikido Mm -hmm. right and you know it really always comes down to the individual athletes and the variables like we talked about right right if you get a super athlete like LeBron James, mm-hmm. right, and you teach him Aikido from the best Aikido teacher in the world, right, that guy's going to be able to hit a lot of those techniques. Right. Like in, in real life. Mean? In real life, yeah, yeah. Why not? You know, he has great hand-eye coordination. He's fast mm-hmm. and athletic. The guy's swinging wildly. The guy has no experience striking. You know, he's like falling over throwing these punches already. Right. You know, and then like a simple shove in the right direction, which, you know, what Aikido is, right, mm-hmm. misdirecting and pushing and you know, taking the person down, yes, mm-hmm. right? But when you watch the choreographed training of Aikido, it mm-hmm. literally just looks like a dance. And then right. it's easy for people to be like, ah, there's no merit here. Mm. But a lot of the times it's like uh, symbolic of like, you push in this direction, then I could take you in this direction. Right. And there's wrist locks in Aikido that are pretty effective, I think. Mm-hmm. 
you know, reaching out, grabbing a wrist and then twisting it and taking the person down, I don't think is very effective. Right. right? But like a simple arm drag to a back take, right, or something like this, and then pulling the person down when they push back into you, like that could definitely work. Mm -hmm. Right. Any technique can pretend, you know, they say like a broken clock is right twice a day. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's right once a day if it's a digital clock. Right. (laughs) It's kind of like that, too. You know, there's techniques in Aikido that will always work. Right. Not always work. Like under the right conditions. Right. right. The right variables at the right time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the problem with Aikido a lot of the times is you spend all your time doing Aikido and then you don't expand your horizon to the other martial arts. And then you say, oh, Aikido is great for self-defense and I could defend myself against MMA fighters. And then you start teaching this idea that my martial art is the best. My mm-hmm. martial art works the best. And now everyone who's taken that class is like, oh, yeah, this is the way. This is right. the only way to defend yourself. It's false and, sense you know, of uh, security. Yeah, man. And yeah. Uh, I've been to a Krav Maga school one time. Right. You know, like I saw one Krav Maga school. I walked in just to say hi and talk and, mm-hmm. you know, asked around. And I was like, maybe I'll go check out a class. I do that stuff, you know, because mm-hmm. I, I love martial arts. Right. And the guy was like, what do you do? And I kind of didn't want to give him my position of like, oh, I do this right. martial art, that martial art. This is before I was famous on YouTube. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? So, you know, I'm like, oh, nothing. I just lift a lot of weights. And he goes, yeah. lifting weights won't help you in the streets. I'm like, okay, you know, that's right. a weird thing to say. I was like, how about judo, though? And he's like, judo's garbage. You know, that'll never work on the street. People don't wear a jacket. I was like, what about boxing? He's like, boxing, you wear these huge gloves on your hands. Your hands are bare right now. What are you going to do if I attack you and punch you in the mouth? I'm like, man, this guy's freaking aggressive, uh-huh. you know? And he's like, Krav Maga is the only thing that works. If you join our program, you'll be able to defend yourself against knife attackers, gun attackers, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, man, this guy. Right. He's like, you know, I could take any MMA fighter. And I'm like... Well, this is what you teach a student. Like, that's extremely yeah. misleading. And it's right. coming from a guy that was probably like 130 pounds soaking wet. He's older. He looked like he's smoking cigarettes. I was like, this guy, there's no freaking way that this guy is who he says he is. Right. And he has a massive following. Right. And I was just like, that is a disservice. That is a sin. Yeah. You know what I mean? That is messed up. That's, right? yeah. So I'm not just, you know, making fun of Krav Maga. I'm just saying there's people like that in every martial art. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And that, you raise an interesting point about this mythical street. Like a lot of, mm. a lot of criticism about these uh, martial arts like Aikido, Judo, even BJJ. Like people uh, talk about how BJJ is not good for, uh, not necessarily good for uh, self-defense situations. And a, big, a lot of times people just kind of point to this mythical idea of the street. Well, I, I'm, I think... We kind of talked about it in the previous episode about judo, uh, Japanese judo technique names. But when you want to have a, a constructive discussion about a, a, a concept, you need to have a shared definition. And yes, yeah, and yeah. The, Man, I don't even I know that. what the street means in uh when a lot of people talk about the streets are the streets man yeah well yeah, i don't even know like what is it like oh is it the bar or is it the you know the the avenues and the streets of new york city or like at the yeah. strip mall it's anyway I, yeah man. i digress a little bit but i think i think oh yeah we we should be careful about mentioning the streets yeah. like oh does this martial art work on the streets yeah we should come up with a uh definition Oh, the streets. Man. What is the street? What are the streets? I I'm cooped up here, so now the streets is just my living room. In a way, I need. To, <laughs> I, have no, I have no idea. I I don't I don't even want to venture into that because I know. Yeah. It's it's a I think it's a dangerous thing because it uncontrolled environment. Boom. Yeah, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good. It is still a little vague, but I guess in a way, yeah. You would just say, for example, would just say a competition. Is a in the, under your definition? Would that would competition? No, there's a lot of be, things being controlled. Right. Temperature is controlled, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Someone you know throws a bottle, they get kicked out. Right. A lot of things are controlled. Yeah. There's rules. You know I what see. I mean? So out, out of your comfort zone, in a way. Yeah. 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 The streets, you know, and that's the thing. When people think self defense, they always think one to one. Right. right? Right, but it's right. never one. Is it ever one to one? You know, uh, I've been in a couple of scuffles in my day. You know, when I was younger, and it's rarely ever one to one. 
Yeah, you're you know, probably well, with your friends, seen, and then yeah. but I've seen like fights on the street where these guys were like, "All right, me and you, right? Me and you, right? You know, just me and you, right?" And then they start doing their thing, and then this guy's friend just jumps <laughs> in and then like hits him in the back of the head. Like yeah. that's happened, you know? Uh, right. I'll tell you one story, man. I was yeah. in a bar once uh, on New Year's when I was like 22, 23 years old, uh-huh. and this kid got into it, you know, like, with you, with another guy. No, no, oh, with another, another person. Dude. Okay. And then I tried to stop it. I was like, hey, guys, come on. It's New Year's, you know? And I literally put myself between it. (laughs) And then, (laughs) so stupid. I literally put myself like, guys, relax. Happy New Year's. You know, let's all chill out, Mm. you know? And these guys, and one of the guys was an FBI agent. And he's like, I'm a freaking FBI agent, man. I'm a freaking FBI agent, man. I'll freaking throw you in lock the slammer and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, relax, relax. You know, like he's yelling at this dude. And then one of their friends tried to throw a bottle at one of them and nailed me in the face with it. Oh, they'll do all the innocent yeah. bystander. Like, like uh, I think it was this guy's friend uh-huh. wanted to throw a bottle at this guy, and then his friend from over there whipped the bottle and like missed oh both of them. Oh my god! Nailed me in the forehead. Dude, and then I, uh, I hope you're okay. Like, that's that's fine. Yeah, I just had a, a puffy eye, and right. then it was like pandemonium. People freaking, you know, scrapping. Oh, after that, right? everything goes. And then I got behind this dude, and I put the, <laughs> this guy in a chokehold. Right? And then <laughs> yeah. I'm like, and then the bouncers come, mm-hmm. right? And then as I'm holding this guy, these random bystanders just start throwing body shots to this dude. Oh, right? to the, oh, to the yeah. guy who you are not holding. even like my friends. You know, okay. not even my friends, just random dude. I'm like holding this guy. I got nailed in the bottle and then you just, just start, these guys start shoving and I grab one of them and then I put him in it and I didn't want my back exposed. So like right. back step, like all the way back to the bar because the bar right. is pretty close. And then like, and then just like try to push myself up against something. So people aren't yeah. behind me. Right. And then I'm like holding them. Awareness, you know, and then, situational and awareness. And then I see yeah. the bouncer like walking through, right. and I'm like, ah. And then he's like coming over, and he's like shoving people out of the way, right? Yeah. And then these random dudes just punching this dude, and I'm like, oh my god, it's it, yeah, that's. And then uh, there was a lot of bouncers because it was like you know New Year's, uh-huh. and then like uh, it was really cool how uh, they're trying to kick me out. And then these guys who were hitting this random dude was like, he was trying to stop it. He was trying to stop it. Oh. And they all like came to my defense. Uh huh. And then I was like a hero for a hot second. Oh, so you got, but you got to stay in the bar too? Yeah, I got to stay. Nice. It was a good nice. time. <laughs> my buddy Mike was there. He was throwing hands. It was crazy. It's crazy. That's. But I, like, that, there's nothing martial about any of that. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, there's some martial, but it's like that guy. I I was not I was aware I was attentive you know right. I mean I was drunk but then I got hit in the face with a bottle right, right. there's no it's like you should have parried it if you box you should yeah, have parried and it <laughs> and if you did you know weapons training and you know there's a good chance like I had both my arms linked mm-hmm. right that you know the person next to me could have thrown a huge, huge right and yeah. then taken me taken me out yeah this is without a doubt you know right. And the bouncer is much bigger than me. So it's like mm-hmm. I could be choking and then the bouncer could get behind me and put me in a choke. Mm-hmm. And now I'm forced to defend the choke. I let the guy go. Guy turns around and starts booting me in the stomach. Nothing I can do about it. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like you got to not get yourself in those situations. I was young. Yeah. I was young. I don't, <laughs> well, I think you know. the important point there to note is that thanks to your training, I think, you know, you like there's a big contrast between that guy you and the guy who was just like trying to get in the action and then throwing punches, you know, the, yeah. I think you had the awareness. I think that's the important point. Like whatever martial art you take, yeah. whether it be judo, BJJ, Aikido, whatever, I think it'll at least give you the mental space during this yeah. crazy, crazy time to control yeah. yourself and control at least remove as many variables as possible like you you yeah. walked back to the bars to so that yeah you know no one is behind you and they're trying to take you down or whatever yeah yeah so on that but note, you can't remove all yeah. the variables that's, that's right. the thing and when you're confident yeah. like oh i could you know survey the room and control and figure out all the exits are and put my back to the wall when there's more than one attacker yeah. like you're fooling yourself if you think you could right. actually do that you know, honestly, man, it's like if I would have had two more shots or like three more beers or something like this, that, that could have ended no disastrously. Yeah. You know, if I would have nailed and if he would have hit me a little bit harder with the bottle of the guy, right? It was just oh, like yeah. a lobbing bottle, right? You know, but if you would have really whipped it and nailed me in the face, if I went down and these guys started kicking me in the head, 
you can't control those variables. I right. got lucky. You know, I got extremely yeah. lucky. You know, and the best thing probably to do from a self-defense standpoint is these two guys are arguing about this guy's FBI and that guy's that. And then you <laughs> spill beer on my shoes. Don't hit on my girlfriend. It's like, all right, let me stay out of it. You right. know? And that's uh, I think that's one the lesson that uh, in hindsight, it's like you got to stay out of it. Yeah. Don't it, get yourself involved, especially if you have family. It's like I'm not saying everyone not to you know step in when there's a conflict. I'm not right. saying that. But, you know, just from a purely self-defense standpoint and self-preservation, you know, if things are going on and things are crazy, you can't get involved. Right. You know? And then, yeah, that, I, you know, people kind of joke about, oh, the best self-defense technique is for you to take running. Like, you know, start, yeah, start running. You yeah, run. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right? So now that we covered Aikido and they talked a little bit about uh, self-defense situations, how about now, how about Japanese Jiu-Jitsu? A lot of people... Mention that in the context of self-defense, especially because it kind of still has the el- both elements, right? The striking and then the grappling. Yeah, striking, grappling. That's a tricky one, too, you uh-huh. know, because it depends who your teacher is, right? right? I remember my father's Kokushu Jiu-Jitsu, the Japanese martial arts style, right. the, there was a heavy emphasis on the fighting side. Right. Especially when my father was younger. Not right. so much in his later years where he was like, all right, I don't really want to see people, you know, mm-hmm. doing all this stuff. But, you know, in the 80s and 90s, even when I was growing up, we had Tuesday night sparring. Mm -hmm. And it's like you could do light shots to the head, hard shots to the body, and then you could take the person down. So it was kind of like MMA rules. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then after we finished uh, doing that sort of sparring on Tuesday nights, then we would also do Niwaza training, which is just straight up groundwork and submission work. Mm -hmm. But you could do do like fake punches to the head sort of thinking. Like Mm -hmm. when you're like kind of slapping, like, you know, they have that combat jiu-jitsu stuff. Right. We've been doing that, you know, and that was part of the Japanese jiu-jitsu curriculum. Once Mm -hmm. you get to the brown and black belt level, you could train. Mm -hmm. And then Friday night was just straight striking sparring. Right. Right. Like uh, with the pads and everything, with the chest protectors, with the headgear and the foot and the shin guards, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So... You know, it depends where you learn Japanese jiu-jitsu, but mm-hmm. the traditional style of like the person goes like that and you tuck your chin and go like this and go like that, you know, that may not happen. Right. You know, if you're just memorizing those specific sequences and you don't have any improvisational sort of element to your training, mm-hmm. then that's going to be a problem when the person does go for something that you've never really encountered, mm-hmm. right? Because you can't sort of consciously say okay that's that technique technique three from the side attack position yeah you know like <laughs> engage combat form yeah. number eight you know like and start doing this like, like it just doesn't work that way yeah you know what i mean so you need that sort of non-cooperative combative training right. in your tool set to develop right. some of these improvisational skills and some japanese jiu-jitsu martial arts really emphasize this right you know um it's kind of going back to the yeah. point about control like removing control, the variables yeah. control yeah. removing variables and if you're a great martial artist right right you think about this stuff and you know the ultimate thing about martial arts is self-improvement right you're making mm-hmm. yourself better and how do you make yourself better right not by going to a school listening to this one guru and just doing everything and not really thinking outside the box you have to challenge some of this stuff right take all the information with a grain of salt and then you got to grow on your own mm-hmm. right and then a lot of the times, you know, the person next to you needs to get better. So I'd make them better and they make me better. Mm-hmm. And it's a mutual, beneficial, right. synergistic relationship. Mm-hmm. And once you kind of have that, then you could start elevating yourself above just the technique. People only see the technique. It's like, oh, you know, uh, Krav Maga technique, combat one to five, mm-hmm. Aikido technique one to eight, which one works more, why this <laughs> one was selected, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, great. You know? And that curriculum stuff is real. You need a linearly progressive right. uh, curriculum to, to learn. You don't need it, but, you know, it helps, mm-hmm. right? And some people like to think in that way. But you need the element of, like, me versus you. Let's see what happens. These are sort of the rule sets, so we keep each other safe. Right. Right? And then we take it from there. So that's my sort of two cents on Japanese jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. But... You know, some people really thrive in that environment. And yeah. some people really thrive in just the nitty-gritty of, like, grinding heads and grinding, right. you know, right. combative sort of a setting, mm-hmm. right? So there's a place for all of it. It's just really having the instructor being able to elaborate right. these things, you know, right. not just Instead saying, of being, my yeah. style is the best, you know, hey, if someone comes and choke you, you go like this. And then if they're just limited to the techniques, mm-hmm. then they don't know anything, yeah. right? They don't know, right? So 
it's you know your job also as a consumer because it is a consumable product, a service, mm. to be educated and to think outside the box and you know use your own brain. Right. So on that note, we're gonna kind of switch gears and then talk rest talk about wrestling, which is I guess not a martial art technically, but it's you know it's it's I consider it martial art. You think yeah. it's a martial art? Yeah. Anyway, so you're uh, for those who don't know, <coughs> Shintaro is an accomplished wrestler. Um, Not that accomplished, but you know, accomplished enough. Like a, yeah. <laughs> college, a couple of accolades, you know, yeah. won some tournaments. Yeah, something like I mean, that. that's, that's <laughs> accomplished I mean? in my book. Um, I guess so. Anyway, so the yeah, what do you think about wrestling in this context of self defense? I think wrestling has the biggest component of the non cooperative combative side which is right. takedowns right. right and takedowns are hugely hugely useful mm -hmm. taking someone from their feet down to their floor is amazing because if you're standing everyone's semi-athletic people walk around all day trying right. not to fall over you know what i mean you take them down you put them on the ground and they have a lot most of the time no clue what to do mm -hmm. right especially like you can't throw a punch from the bottom like mm -hmm. if you aren't skilled and trained to do so right you get right. a lot more punching power coming downward Right. right. With the assistance of gravity. Right. You know what I mean? So immediately when you have a person swinging wildly, there's always a chance of that one punch knockout of like, I got caught on the chin, I go down. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you could take him down hard. Right. Less, to where, less of an issue. Yeah. You take him down hard. Boom. They hit the ground. They're like, ah, hit my shoulder on the concrete on the way down. And now you're on top of them. And they're trying to throw these, you know, punches from the bottom with their back to the floor where they can't build momentum or push right. off the ground. You know, and they have no real kinetic chain. Mm -hmm. to transfer that energy all of a sudden you've taken away their only only chance of winning yeah right uh, whether you know how to submit or not right you know, wrestlers are athletic enough and know enough and do enough to stay on top after they take the person down because it's their entire goal right right so if they could take you down you know take away the only shot that you have connecting uh for that one lucky punch mm -hmm. right and then if they could stay on top and then throw down punches that's a huge advantage Right. Of course, without taking into account the variables of, you know, is the person skilled themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Weight difference, how long you've been training, and how many people you're defending against. But I think that's why wrestling has huge, huge merits, mm -hmm. you know, in this world. And I think it is a martial art. I because, see. Because, you know, my definition is just a word itself, martial, warlike, art. Right. Art. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like yeah. warlike art, and then it's like imposition of my will versus you. Mm-hmm. That, right and it's territorial and space and mm -hmm. you know fighting for this is mine mm -hmm. right these are my goals right i need to accomplish opposing goals and, yeah yeah so and that's hugely beneficial so uh i'm being a little i might be being a little um uh pedantic here but you know the this is a personal question of mine because i wrestle in high school too you know uh when you're taught shooting in wrestling yeah you kind of travel on your knees in a way you have to go because yeah. you have to uh get low level change and all yeah. that but you can't really do that on this mythical streets where there's no the padding street, the streets street, yeah. yeah um so uh, i know you made some step. yeah so why what do you what do you do in uh to that's a very for interesting that? question very interesting question. I love that question and I have a, a phenomenal answer for it that I don't think a lot of people have the same answer. Uh -huh. If I'm going to pat myself on the back here. The drop step. Why do we take the drop step in wrestling? Why don't you just shoot on the legs without taking the drop step? Right. Uh, why? Level change. I, that's what I was taught. Because you got to yeah, go on. Why do we need the level change to do that? Uh, you know, to come lower than the center of gravity, I guess. See, Maybe. like I should have been thinking more. I should have been thinking more when I was being taught yeah. about this. You got to think, you know. So, all right, two lines of three lines of defense for taking takedown defense, right? Right. Your arms, your head, and your hips. Those are the three lines of defense. Right. You want to clear the arms and the head to access the legs for the right. shot. Right. If the your opposing person, your uke, is very low in their stance because they want to keep their head and their arms right. and in between. You know, between you and my legs. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So if they're taking that natural low stance, you have to go even lower. Mm -hmm. And the only way you could go lower if both people are squatting down I is see. to take the drop step. Right. right. But if you're fighting somebody, if they're upright and their hands are up, right, now all of a sudden you don't need the level change because all you have to do is a light squat 
and now all of a sudden your head and your arms are below the person. So you have that means access you can just go to the, straight, right? Yeah, into their body. I you see. Know, maybe not even access to their leg, maybe access to their hips, mm -hmm. right? So you actually don't need to take a drop step. And people, you know, train the drop step, drop step, drop step. But you know, like I did, like a split stance double leg takedown. Mm -hmm. You know, on my YouTube channel. Go check that out, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Right, so it's like a upright position. You know, people are throwing hands and things like this. And you know, I know somebody's gonna comment in below, like, "Oh, you're gonna go for a double standing double. You could eat a knee to the face." Right. Of course, you can eat a knee to the face. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can. You know, like who you're defending yourself against. You know, an MMA fighter. Yeah, if you're just shooting on the legs, you're gonna you're gonna eat a knee. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you have any striking skill to feign? and show and posture to the other person, hey, I might punch you in the face. So then they go like this for the defense, and that's yes. when you blast in on the double right. without dr doing a drop step because right. you're already lower than the person. right? You've already cleared right. their arms and their head. Now, all of a sudden, you have to clear their hips, but do they know how to defend with their hips? Probably not. Most likely, they cannot. Right. right? And if you have a good position, athletic stance, you literally just double leg tackle them right off their feet, and now you can take them down. And then, you know, you could control them down to where they hit their head first or back first or all that stuff. To the mythical you streets. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> In the mythical streets. That's a good answer, right? Yeah, yeah that is. I, I, I think the context, I think mm -hmm. it, it, you co keep coming back to this point. It's the context. You have yeah. to think about the context you're in. Yeah. That's a, yeah. well, yeah, that's a good, that's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I've always it's hard to, that. when you're in the wrestling room. Right. Or you're doing an MMA class. It's mm -hmm. like, this is how you shoot a double. And then people are teaching the drop step, the drop step. It's like, when I wrestled in high school, this is how we learned it. Right. And this is how I'm going to teach it to you. And it's like, why do we do the drop step? Because it's level change. Okay. And everyone's doing it. But if the person in the room is there specifically for self-defense. There's no need. Why do yeah. you have to take the, the drop step? You don't right. need to. Right. You know what I mean? You don't need to bring your knees to the floor. Why uh, can you do this on concrete? It might hurt my knee. It's like, yeah, just don't take a knee. Mm -hmm. When you're shooting in the streets then, the mythical streets then. It's mm -hmm. like, then, okay, then why are we drilling it this way? Right. And then most of the time, they don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Right? You need to... But for you teachers out there, now you guys have an answer. <laughs> I think, <laughs> yeah, you need to... All this, like, uh, standard techniques, the way they're being taught right now, yeah. you, you, you have to... There is a reason behind every single technique the you know and we have to understand that reason yeah to in order to expand yeah. beyond that yeah and that's a good point um so now uh let's talk about the big one brazilian jiu-jitsu bjj mm, in the south yeah Cup. i you know all bjj the greasiest i know the big component or the big marketing strategy they went for is that on the mythical streets, ninety percent of the fights go end up on the ground. So you gotta yeah, know how to yeah. do that. So I know it's a big <laughs> selling point in BJJ. So huge selling point, yeah. huge, yeah. So what do you what do you uh, say to what do you think about BJJ as a self defense martial art? Oh, it's one of the best. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. one of the best for sure. But like everything, it comes down to the individual athlete and the teacher. Right, mm -hmm. the teacher matters so much. You know, and having a different style of jujitsu. Right is very important. If you do a deep half guard and that's your primary game, yeah, right, that's the one of the worst ones because your head is right in between the guy's legs when they're sitting, and then that punch right. coming down to your face when you're deep half guard. That's really you know that's a knockout punch. Right, you know what I mean. Uh, so then all of a sudden, if you think of it that way, deep half guard, you know, you can't really do. You know what I mean. If you have no takedown abilities and you sit guard. Right. And then there's two people. Yeah. There's no way. Because, right. you know, the whole entire thing is like, oh, keep my legs in between us. Right. On bottom position. Open guard concepts, blah, blah, blah. But if you have two people walking around this direction, there's no way you could keep your legs in between both. Mm -hmm. And can you defend yourself? Yeah, you can. You know what I mean? But it really depends. Like, are you a sports jiu-jitsu person? You know, there's instructors that sort of specialize in that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh and is that you know the same jujitsu that you get from this other guy that's only teaching sport in a gi right you know so but i do think there's a lot of stuff in bjj that's extremely useful mm -hmm. and i come back to the concept of non-cooperative training right right there's cooperative tra you have to have cooperative training first to be able to make the shapes of the technique right right you have to have a cooperating opponent 
having a neutral position or giving you the right looks to be able to coordinate the, the drills and the techniques. Right. And once you get to a point, you have to do resistance training, mm-hmm. not resistance like in the way of the weights, but a non-cooperative and combative training. Right. And jujitsu have a big element. They yeah. call it rolling. Right. right. Judo calls it rondori. Uh, BJ calls it rolling and then wrestling calls it live. Let's right. go live. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they have that. So of course it's going to help. Right. You know, jujitsu is a great one. You know, the question of judo versus jujitsu, you could make that argument all day. You know, I could slam someone and end it. Yeah, yeah, you can, mm-hmm. you know, but if I don't succeed there and if I'm on the ground with a high level jujitsu guy, their submission game is superior. Mm-hmm. Right. I said it. I said it. You know, yeah. I know that. You know what I mean? So it really depends. And how many people are you defending yourself? If you're on the crowd at New York City subway mm-hmm. and, you know, you get four kids, I don't want to say kids, but like four people yeah. attacking you, you really, really don't want to be on the ground. Right. You know, and that's one instance where judo may take the cake. Right. So you know what I mean? It's- All of a sudden, maybe you're in a dark alley and you're going up against someone really, really big and strong. Right. Take and to it's the just one to one. Yeah. Take them to the ground, you know, and maybe you can't take them down, right? Maybe mm. you can't throw them in judo because the guy's just such a freak athlete. Maybe right. he played football and he's just right. a freak, you know what I mean? And you've only done judo for three months. <laughs> but a BJJ person can pull guard mm. and that big guy's not going to know what to do, right. right? And then maybe they go, you know, I don't know, I'm just doing it. And the guy goes right into the guard to ground and pound and then they could slip it and then take his back and then now they could rear naked choke. Right. But can the same judo practitioner with the same amount of months and training mm do that and execute that probably not because that mm. person probably just learned a sort right. right right you can't train all of it you don't have time to learn all of it you right. just cannot right you know what i mean so those are sort of different variables and you know uh can you do bjj only self-defense where you have zero knowledge of striking mm-hmm. no you can't right right so you need a little bit of the strike knowledge you need a little bit of the standing mm. stuff you need a little bit of the ground stuff you know and Martial artists have to start to start looking at it, you know, in the whole view, with the contextual view. Right. You know what I mean? So in that, within the, like, w- while we're talking about the context, I know uh, within BJJ, there's a big dis- debate about, you know, s- traditional BJJ versus sports BJJ. I, I, I'm not quite sure on the terminologies here, but, you know, the yeah. you kind of mentioned the sports BJJ side and then the I guess the t- more traditional side. Like, what do you yeah. what do you th- think about that divide in in the context of self defense? Like, you know, lot, so even yeah. in judo, there's the same thing. Right. right, there's that sports side, and then there is the traditional side. Mm-hmm. And even if you look at boxing, you have the people who spar. So when people come into the dojo, it's like, yeah, I boxed for fucking three years. You know whatever right. it is, right? It's like, did you really box, or did you go in eight a.m. hit the pads, hit the right. mitts, talk around, and then you've never really got in the ring, right? You know, I, I would say like if you go to a boxing gym, 95% of their clientele don't go in the ring. They don't right. spar, right? Because it's the Wall Street guys. It's the moms and dads. They want to get a workout before work, after work, yeah. hit pads, feel like they know how to punch somebody. You know what I mean? Mm. And it's the same idea with judo and jiu-jitsu and every single other martial art, mm. you know? Uh, I think it's beautiful that judo and jiu-jitsu have a sport aspect to it where they can compete at a high level. Right. Because when you have high-level competition, a lot of people doing it, a lot of people following the rules, keeps the athletes safe and they could really compete and then Mm -hmm. sharpen their game and then compete with each other, it elevates all of it. It elevates the entire technique. New ideas come about. I cannot believe that guy did that Cabarelli liftoff with the leg in judo. Oh, I need to learn that. I learned that. You know, he learned that. I teach it. All my students do it. Now... They're doing it. That becomes a standard. And someone in Russia is going to learn to counter it. And then someone counters it. Mm -hmm. And then it just elevates the sport. And all of a sudden now there's this entire sequence and pattern of attacks and defenses that wasn't really available, Mm -hmm. you know, 20, 30 years ago. And now some of that stuff, can it be used in a martial setting? Maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, there's very, very interesting stuff that can potentially come about in competition. That's right. Like, for instance, if you look at, sorry to interrupt you, like Connie Basami. Right. You know? Crazy dangerous, people getting injured all the time, you're like, take it out, mm-hmm. you know? And then Jiu-Jitsu is like, ah, let's experiment with it. Let's put it in the thing a little bit, you right. know, and then the nogi thing, and it's working, and it's working, and people are learning it, learning to do it safely, and people blowing their knees out, but they keep doing it. And now there's a whole system mm-hmm. based off Kani Basami, 
you know, like shooting in and sliding in to gain range by pushing off on that hand, right? Or you could just do the kanibasani for the first hand or the far leg or, you know, hooking in and then going for a roll for a rolling knee bar, which transfers over to like the sambo side uh, rolling knee bar series. And, you know, that stuff comes from sport, Mm -hmm. right? It comes from the sport martial art. And now all of a sudden you're in a situation, you know, big guys locking up with a hard overhook or underhook. And then you could go for it and then take down a much bigger and stronger opponent right. in the martial setting. Right. So they actually really need each other. You know what I mean? The sport versus traditional, I think that debate should be over. You yeah. Know, you guys need each other, you know, more than right. you think. You know what I mean? That's, you can't that's just be traditional. Point. Yeah. Right? Because if you're just traditional and doing things your sensei did and the sensei senseis did, nothing will ever get better. Mm-hmm. Oh, they knew what they were doing 100 years ago. Not really. Yeah. You know, like the time is the best now with the information sharing and look mm-hmm. at all these people that could listen to this podcast now and <laughs> fill their heads with my ideas. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I could be wrong though. I could be wrong. And maybe 20 years from now, you know, all these ideas that I'm talking about can be challenged. Right. And it's obsolete. Right. Mm-hmm. You never know. That, you know. So sport, traditional, need each other. Right. That's a I good point. I think we we talked about this a little bit in uh in the Japanese judo technique names uh episode in other in any field yeah there is a it, there is a it, it needs a way to you know pit different techniques against each other you know it, it happens yeah. that i i'm talking about the uh more computer science computer engineering field because that's all i uh i that's what i know best and that in even in that sense there we have it's many competitions, even among researchers and companies, we have these benchmarks, like how fast can your computer go? Calculate this simple yeah. problem. How? Yeah, it's not realistic, these benchmarks. It's not... Like Cinebench? Huh? Like Cinebench? Cinebench? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, when they have the, the graphic thing with the text of GPU and all Oh, yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay, okay, yeah. That kind of stuff, like, you know... Supercomputers, they have this competition and then this organization publishes every year of yeah. top 100 supercomputers in the world and they use this simple mm. like mathematical thing and then, you know, AI models do that. Like, oh, given yeah. this data set, how accurate yeah. is it? It's not real. Those are not realistic, but it's a way for people to test different techniques out and then Mm. compete against each other and in some ways i think it's in the same way sports aspects of these martial arts serve that purpose you you gotta wow. yeah. i love that i love that yeah i think i wow. see this parallel a lot like i think it's important to yeah it, it's a physical activity martial art but in any sport really yeah. but you need to have this kind of scholastic view on things too i think in, wow, you know, I love it. So what you're saying is you train and mm-hmm. you build a prototype and then you have the algorithm and you put it through a computing system in order to collect more data uh-huh. and then you bring it back. Right. And you are, I love it. I love it. Because yeah, like if you have that new algorithm, yeah. okay, uh, how good is it? I don't know. Like o- unless we have some kind of way to test it against another algorithm, which is yeah. the benchmark, which is in the martial arts, it's the sport. You know, it's Man. the. Are it's you getting a company. PhD or something? <laughs> I'm trying. Jeez. I'm trying my best. I I, I don't know. Yeah, you know. getting a PhD. Did you go to Princeton? <laughs> Is that where you went? I did. Princeton or something? Did, Jesus. Yeah, 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 I did go. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Anyway, I feel kind of insecure now. No, nah, like, oh no, nah, like yeah, talking yeah. about goon stuff. Like, ah, I gotta punch the guy in the face and the butt. <laughs> and you're like, well, actually, you know, looking from a scholastic no. view. Yeah, you you have the very <laughs> you have a very scholastic view on things uh, on martial arts, and I think it's it's a very refreshing to hear. I think, um, especially mm-hmm. for me. So now, let's move on to uh, we talked about a lot of grappling arts. Well, yeah. Japanese used to have some striking elements in it, but let's talk about pure striking arts. Taekwondo, okay. boxing, Muay Thai, yeah. all that. What do you, yeah. as a grappler, primarily grappler, uh, what do you think about those uh, uh, striking arts in, in the context mm. of self-defense? Con- that's a great one. And I think they all have their merits, right? Mm-hmm. And that's always sort of the idea. And, you know, you could make uh, little things about each and every one of them. For right. instance, like... If you look at boxing and he's like, yeah, you defend your head by just going like that. And then, but you have this entire 16 ounce puffy thing protecting your head here. Right. right? 
And if you're in the streets and you don't have that, then of course there's a huge gap, you know, all around your fist, uh-huh. right? That you could potentially defend. Uh, the that punches could come through, right? You know what I mean. And then uh, you know you have the old school mentality with the karate of like, oh man, you know, hand wraps and gloves. Like you're not really training your hands to punch someone in the face, you know, with you know hard parts of their head and right. this and that. So you know you could kind of make that argument as well. Mm-hmm. And then the kicks boxers and all this stuff will argue also like the boxing stance. You know, the lead leg sort of takes like a little bit of a inward turn, mm-hmm. right, in order to maximize the the power of the jab right you know what i mean and if you kick to that lead leg Mm. it's very easy to blow that knee out or do some damage there so that's why naturally kickboxing muay thai will have their toes pointing forward or slightly out to be able to check those kicks right right you know what i mean so it's like who are you defending yourself against Mm -hmm. it really comes down to that Mm. you know what i mean uh, if you're a boxer and you're a purebred boxer and the person takes a very low shot to your legs because your hands are up high and, you know, like, you can't time a knee to it because you don't know how to knee somebody. Right. You know? Right. And I think Muay Thai has a lot more elements. Like, they have the elbows and they have this. And <clears throat> they kind of have a good clinch system. Right. Right? To basically, they can't, like, reap from the inside. But you could attack from the outside mm-hmm. uh, to do, you know, foot sweeps, judo foot sweeps. Uh-huh. You know? And if you're a Muay Thai guy, I think the best thing you could learn is the clinching circle de ashi, uh-huh. Which is, like, one of the most... You know, I used to do a little Muay Thai, too. <clears throat> uh, downtown uh, with Joe Sampieri. Yeah. He was a legend. Right, right, right. Unbelievable striker. And we would spar and he was so good. He would just be like, come on, Higashi, kick me in the face, punch me in the face. Mm-hmm. And I would be swinging for six, seven minutes straight, not connecting once, mm. you know, and he would parry and pop me in the face and kick me <laughs> in the leg and he would just cut these angles. Unbelievable. Right. But when we got in the clinch, of course, he could throw elbows and knee me in the stomach, but I was pretty confident, you know, that right. circle foot sweep, <laughs> right? But, you know, like I showed it to him and, you know, he's unbelievable. I'm not trying to be cocky or anything, uh, but that's a technique that can potentially work for Muay Thai guys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's something that judo can help with. You know what I mean? Um, Yeah, you have to kind of do it all. Right. Context, context. You have to kind of do it all. Uh, Muay Thai, boxing, kickboxing, the striking stuff. You know, uh, Taekwondo, yeah, they have the kick, but the points throwing stuff doesn't really translate over. Right. Right. But there's a Taekwondo champ. I think uh, yeah. in Japan, that's unbelievably tall yeah. and athletic and powerful. And you know, you teach that person kickboxing, that person going to do good, right? You know, it comes down a lot to the individual athlete as well. Mm-hmm. All right. I hope I kind of answered that. Yeah, but I mean, even Taekwondo, like the uh, if you see Olympians, they they kick hard. I mean, you probably don't want to take kicks from them. I mean, it's no, every, of course not. Yeah, of every not. every yeah. martial art, yeah, different focus, but has merits. Yeah. And you kind of talked about how you have to do it all. So that kind of begs the question, how about MMA yeah. and self-defense? The idea MMA's is good. that yeah. MMA, you know, it kind of incorporate everything. So what, yeah, what do you does. think about that? Yeah. yeah. Is it the ultimate you know, self-defense martial art then? Oh, that's a <laughs> very good question. <clears throat> I don't think it is, uh-huh. you know, because you just said the word martial art. And I think with martial arts, there's comes sort of embedded philosophies that are very important. Right. Right. And I think judo is the one that has that the most, right? Mm-hmm. It has sort of a code of conduct, code of ethics. It has mutual welfare, benefit and respect, right? It has all these things embedded in the curriculum mm-hmm. that sort of is written about, that's studied, you know, that got, you know, like going way back, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And I think that's very important. You know, you can't just have that where you're just bound to your teachers, this and that, and, you know, falling into this hierarchy. I don't think you can just do that. Right. 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 But in judo, you have that. Mm. You have the ideals, right? And then the code. And, you know, people generally go by it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you go to a combat sporting event. You know, you see it all the time. People getting into arguments and fights and stuff like this. You don't see it that much in judo. Mm -hmm. You do see it. Yeah. You do see it, right? Without a doubt, you know? And, you know, there's always people that coming in. You know who are who are assholes, right? Straight up, yeah. Any anything, you know, right. not just judo, but like even in chess, there are assholes. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. And the, so you can't really help it, right? But MMA, you know, it's great for fighting, mm-hmm. sport fight. It's a sport fighting thing, mm-hmm. you know. And I know mixed martial arts. It's you know taking from the best, uh, but the ultimate goal is to maim someone. Mm-hmm. And being a martial artist, right? That's not that shouldn't be your goal, right? You know what I mean. I had a, I, there's a funny guy, story that I just recently heard. There's this guy who did MMA. He's uh. a jiu-jitsu guy. He's awesome. 
And then he was saying, like, he was in the ring or the cage, yeah. and he had, like, eight fights or something. He went to kick the person in the head. The guy guessed wrong. He ducked down. Yeah. He was about to connect. Hard. Oh, uh-huh. And the moment of impact, he was like, dude, I could take this guy's head off, right? He made eye contact with the guy, and he was like, oh, man, I don't know if I could do it. And then he pulled his kick, spun the route, uh, right, as a, with the momentum. Right, right. And then the guy came in, took a shot, <laughs> took him down and hit him in the face. You oh, know, like, my God. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Like, but that guy is, he's a, you know, maybe he's a real martial artist, right? Mutual respect and benefit. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I think there's a place for MMA. Yeah. I'm not saying there isn't. I, I watch UFC myself. I love it. You know, and, but, you know, it's for the very select few yeah. to be able to do that. You know, you can do that and, you know, go get a PhD, taking those shots to the head all the no. time. You just can't do it. Yeah. You know, could I run a business, you know, uh, getting in the ring and getting punched all the time? You know, it's very difficult, right? right? And it, for the people who love fighting, you know, it's could be good a good outlet. Them, yeah, it could be a yeah. And then yes, you could them. take yeah. MMA classes, right? But you know, I guess it is. Yeah, it's a good martial art for self defense. It is because it yeah. brings a lot of the elements in you know in a fighting context, mm. right? It, so yes, the answer is yes. MMA is a good one for. But how well are these people being trained? You know, mm-hmm. I, I want to make the argument of being a specialist, mm-hmm. right? I like the idea of being a specialist. If you're a specialist grappler, mm-hmm. then you can learn, you know, some of the boxing elements that are sort of the defensive side, right? And then you take that path, mm-hmm. you know? Or if you're a specialist striker, you learn good takedown defense, mm-hmm. right? Not to get taken down. Right. Right. But then of course, you're going to eventually get taken down. So you have to learn a little bit of the ground too. Right. Right. But I think there needs to be, there has to be a case of the specialist, like specializing sort of in striking or grappling first and then sort of venturing off. Right. If you're learning, trying to learn everything, right, <clears throat> I think it's very difficult. Like look at sciences. Mm-hmm. I'm going bring it back to your. your world, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You can't get a PhD in physics and chemistry and bio yeah. and. You just can't get a PhD in everything. Right. Right. You know, but then you get a PhD in something, you get some papers published, and then you could link it with other things. And then businessmen bring you in and exploit you and, (laughs) you know, try to like integrate it into a product, you know, and you can't, right? And I guess some people just, you know, oh, I'm going to do everything. But how many people can do everything? Engineer their own product, you know, understand supply chain management and being able to manage a team properly and do the business back end yeah, and you you can't know, doing do all that. that stuff. And then taking an exit from soup to nuts from start to end. Yeah. You know, how many people can do that by themselves? They can't. You just right. can't do it. Right. So you kind of have to have a sort of specialized path. That was a very good analogy. You know, I think so. Pat myself <laughs> and back for that one. It, it, it now right. like even expands to this point about creativity in a way. Um, mm. So uh, even in everything you do, creativity is important, but creativity is not something that just, it, a lot of people think that it's it's like an epiphany where you just kind of randomly get the idea from the divine yeah. power or something. Mm-hmm. But it's, in actuality, it's, you need, like you said, it, it, you know, a, spe- a specialist are able to be more creative because they uh, know this one field well and when they venture out to other fields and take different ideas they don't have to know the nitty-gritties of everything but if you know one field very well and you're a specialist in it you're grounded in that field but you can then you can venture out to other fields and bring out different ideas and mix things up and that's when creativity happens and then even in martial arts settings yes you you want to like there are different fields like judo, BJJ and yeah. all that. What you want to do is, yeah, you, you, whatever it is, you need to stick to it. Aikido, whatever it is and become a specialist mm-hmm. and then ground yourself into it and then bring other ideas into it. Even in whatever your goal yeah. is, self-defense and whatever. Yeah. And I think you got to find a good teacher. Yeah. That's first and foremost, mm-hmm. because a good teacher can teach you all the wrong things. Right. Right. Right, right, right. And, you know, I don't want to say I'm right and they're wrong, but, you know, if a self-defense martial arts teacher said, this is the only martial art, you got to get out of there. Right. You know, if a martial arts teacher said, you know, you have to get my name tattooed on your chest and if you go anywhere else, <laughs> yeah. you know, you that, that that's another that's, one. Yeah. You know, that's sort of a red flag, right? Mm-hmm. And it really does come down to the instructor, how much, what their knowledge is like. If they're saying, 
You know, if they're using like, this is the best, that one sucks, you know, mm -hmm. all or nothing kind of a mentality. And they can't, I guess, eloquently, you know, explain to you the intricacies of this sort of a thing, mm -hmm. right? You might have to get out. But the problem with that is also like, people can't, I can't have this conversation independently with every single one of my students. Right. There wouldn't be enough time in the day. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm a little bit guilty of that too. You know, you have 30 people on the map for judo mm -hmm. and people are like, hey, does judo work for self-defense? And I'm just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, and that's it, right? You know, it's well, like... It, hopefully this podcast right? will kind of provide you with this avenue, I guess. Have yeah, an in -depth I think that's discussion. nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like anytime it's like, hey, does judo work for self-defense? like, dude, I just did a whole podcast. It's like, it's like, an, it's like an hour. Right. You know, I don't know if you have time. Yeah. But yeah, I think... So... To wrap up, um, yep. we met, we talked talked a lot about context, and you know yeah. it's what the mythical streets are not just one monolithic thing. Mm -hmm. It's about yeah. the context, context, and every how every martial art has something to offer. Um, yeah, and you need to be open minded, and you need to yeah. find a good yeah. instructor that can guide you through that path. So, uh, having said that. Do you have any parting words for the listeners? Yeah, I think you need to have some sort of non-cooperative training. Right. Oh, yeah. Always. I did, but yeah. That's huge, you know. Uh, and if you're a little bit older and you can't just do full-blown sparring, situational mm -hmm. combative sparring, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, you're in side control, I try to escape. You're pinning me, I try to get out. Mm -hmm. You know, working the clinch where we could go light shots to the body. Right. Right. Uh, situ we'll start with the leg and then we'll try to finish the takedown, whatever mm -hmm. it is. You know, you have to adjust it for yourself if you can't do it. And then, you know, sometimes you just can't do that in a class setting when right. everyone's doing this and everyone's doing Rondori. Uh, but having an open dialogue with your instructor is huge because maybe they can cater, mm -hmm. right? There's always time, you know, in the dojo where the mat space is not being used. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and not like a very well-run business a lot of the times, you know, yeah. most of the time because you're a martial artist. You yeah. know? You're not great at running a business. You know, same with my dojo. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you need a little bit of that. And I think the one thing we didn't really talk about is kata and form, uh -huh. you know? But that does fall into the category of, right? Cooperative. Right. Right? You need and that you gotta for You got to make some yeah. of the shapes. Yeah. Yeah. You need to have the basic coordination and all this stuff. So there's a place for it. Right? And that's the answer. Most of the time, there's a place for it. Mm -hmm. You know, someone came up with a move, set of moves, you know, for a reason. Right? But you have to think bigger. You have to think... What is your opponent doing? Who is your opponent? Mm -hmm. Who's teaching you the stuff? What about this? What do these guys think? You know, and it's like, kind of almost treated like a religion. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about religion next. <laughs> oh, man. We're getting, we're venturing <laughs> out. kidding. So, yeah, judo is good for self-defense. Yeah. As is a lot of other martial arts. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah, please watch my YouTube. Follow my Instagram. This is to we the have pop a podcast. Podcast <laughs> every week. Yeah, I'm not very good at this part, but yep. And your Let's live streams. And, uh, live, live stream, stream. I mean, live stream every Tuesday. Yeah. So That's check it out. Right. Tuesdays at 9 p.m. and I've been doing it. Mm -hmm. We'll see how long that lasts. But hopefully it lasts. Yeah. Not that popular. <laughs> but, you know, some people like it. Yeah. So. I mean, that's, a, that's another way of uh, giving back to you guys. So, yeah, well, thanks for listening, guys. Um, and uh, stay tuned for the next one. Yep. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks. And thank you, Peter. Thank you.